Lamb. But this hour, Brother Chris Caseboat, who is the preacher for the Stony Creek Church of Christ right here, he's going to be speaking to us on in the book of Jude. He is the believer's hope. But Brother Denver Tate's going to come and lead us in a song, and then Brother Chris will give us a lesson. They tried, my Lord and Master, with no one to defend. Good afternoon. That's about what I was expecting. <laughs> you know, when you get to the Wednesday afternoon sessions of the lectureship, as you can tell, attendance starts dropping off. Everybody's getting tired. Most people are heading back to their home congregations in preparation for midweek Bible study. And so I am very grateful that you have uh, stuck around and that you are going to see this uh, to the end. Um, I'm very happy that Steve and Kim Higginbotham are, are here with us this afternoon. I would like to say that they came all the way up here from Knoxville to, to hear me speak this afternoon, but it was just a, a happy coincidence that uh, Steve is holding a gospel meeting over at the Elizabethan Church of Christ this week. And so they're kind enough to, to come into the lectureship uh, for a couple days and, and support it. So I will say this, turnabout's fair play. Uh, not tonight because we still have our lectureship here, but Steve is still preaching at Elizabethan tomorrow night. This is the last night of his meeting. So if you are still in the area, I would invite you to avail yourself of that. You will not be disappointed. In the New Testament, we have 27 different writings and these writings are, are comprised of different genres, we might say. There, there's narrative accounts, such as the Gospels, that, that tell about the life and, and the ministry of Jesus. There are uh, letters that were written uh, by Paul would be the ones that would come to mind uh, most frequently. Uh, the letters that he wrote to the Corinthian congregation and, and to Galatia and Ephesus and things like this. There's history accounts. We refer to the book of Acts as the history of the church. And so all these different accounts all comprised, uh, put together, comprised the New Testament. And in each of these, as we have seen this week, Jesus is portrayed in very distinct ways that point to his, his nature, his purpose, and his ultimate victory that should give, give us a greater appreciation for who he is, what he has done, and what we stand to receive as a result of that. And so in this session this afternoon, we are going to consider the 26th writing 
in the New Testament, the epistle or letter of Jude. And I would invite you to open up your Bibles to the letter of Jude. Uh, it's tucked in there in between 3rd John and Revelation, a very short uh, letter in and of itself. And many times when we refer to this writing, it's typically in an attempt to bolster our resolve in defending the truth. And this is right and this is good to do. The most probably a quoted verse from Jude is verse 3, when Jude says, Beloved, I, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. And many times we, we come to this verse, we read just this verse, as I said, in an attempt to bolster our resolve uh, in what we may consider apologetics, the, the defense of the truth. But what is it that allows us to contend earnestly? Did you just write that, assuming the Christians would just automatically go out and be bold? What makes it worthwhile for us to do so? Therein we find hope. Hope is what makes it worthwhile for us to contend earnestly for the faith. In Jude, as we will see, Jesus is the believer's hope. And as you read through this letter, what you'll find is that the word hope is not used one time. The word hope in and of itself is not found within the text of Jude, but the principle of hope is readily present throughout the entirety of the letter. And as Jude begins, he contrasts that which produces true hope with what results in hopelessness. He makes sure we understand the distinction between that which is true, attainable hope, and that which is nothing. I want you to read with me in Jude verse 4. He says, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into licentiousness or sensuality, and denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The denial of God will never result in hope. He says there were those that were pointed out, marked for such a thing that you may know, right? That they may recognize. But the rejection of reality will never result in a sustained hope. And the reality is God is. But there are those who refuse to accept it. Many who deny God to try to offer perhaps a man-centered, a false hope. The idea of humanism comes from that fact that you exist unto yourself and yourself alone. And therefore any hope that you may have is derived by your mere existence. But then we have some that just deny everything outright. I want to share with you a quote from an atheist author whose name I am not going to try to pronounce. It's harder than many of the Greek words that I had to pronounce in school. But he says in his book entitled Pearls of Eternity, which is interesting in and of itself, he says, from the club of what atheists call false hope and false God, which offers solace to weak minds, Atheists are calling you to their club of no God and no hope, which offers nothing in return. Join the club only if you are a strong-minded individual capable of handling your life alone without the help of God. To this I say, what a miserable existence. To exist in and of yourself where the only good thing about life is whatever you do. Because I'm not sure about y'all, but for me, I fail many times. And if my hope rested entirely upon all that I was able to do, then I would have no hope. 
Denial of God will always result in hopelessness, no matter how it's packaged. No matter how sincere some may claim that their belief in self is, hopelessness will always be the end result. But here's the kicker. Total rejection of God, such as atheism or agnosticism, is not the only form of denial. You see, in, in Jude verse 4, he does mention specifically, there are those who deny God. And we equate that with groups that I, that I just mentioned. But Jude gives examples in the following verses of other forms of denial that are equally just as hopeless. I want you to consider with me verse 5. He says, but I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. The danger of unbelief will result in hopelessness. What Jude is referring to is Israel's rebellion that we can find back in Numbers chapters 13 and 14. On the edge of Canaan, they were ready, Israel was ready to go into the land that had been promised them generations before. But they decided to listen to the ten faithless spies instead of the two that were faithful. And upon listening to, to the report of the ten faithless spies and heeding their words of supposed wisdom... They decided, Israel did, that they did not believe God was capable of keeping his promise. They may not have said it verbatim in that way, but their actions says it for them. They decided to turn their back on God. They didn't believe that he was going to deliver into their hands those that already inhabited the land of Canaan. Referring to the same situation, the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, he says, For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. In those four verses, the word unbelief was never used until the very end. But I want you to see rebelled, sin, those who did not obey, all that can be summed up in the word unbelief acknowledging God and I hope you understand what I mean by that just admitting that there is a deity acknowledging that there is a creator when we do that we acknowledge God but we do not believe and what he says is to deny him. And will always result in hopelessness. We have many, many friends, possibly family members, that are guilty of this very thing. They acknowledge God. They believe in God. They try to live a life that is pleasing to God, but they reject the very truth that he gave to us. Such individuals are guilty of denying God through their disobedience. Jude would go on with another example in verse 6. He says, In the angels... 
following up the discussion about Israel, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Now this is one of those instances where God has given us exactly what we need to know, even if it's not what we want to know. Oh, you can find many, many, many different theories about the angels that have fallen, right? The angels that, that uh, did not keep their proper domain. There's a lot of ideas out there trying to explain what this means. Here's the fact. Angels, angelic beings, rejected the supreme authority of God and they set their own authority as supreme. That's what we need to understand about this. Maybe you've heard the, the, the saying, we don't need to know how the sausage is made. And there's, for us, it's probably a good thing. That applies to this understanding. Let's not get caught up in the weeds of trying to figure out what's not there and just understand exactly what God wants us to know. The rejection of his authority will always result in hopelessness. When we set up ourselves as the ultimate authority, any perceived hope will not last. Because, in fact, it's not real. Peter would echo what Jude mentioned over in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. He says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, I want you to answer me this as we think about the angels and their rejection of God's authority. Does it sound like rejecting his authority brings any kind of hope. Not when the result is being chained in darkness awaiting the final judgment wherein the decision has already been made where you are going to go. There is no hope in that. That is as hopeless as it can be. But even angels who were created a little higher than man Remember, again, what the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 7 and 9, talking about Jesus taking the, the form of a man, said that he was made a little lower than the angels, right? Therefore, we can imply that angels are created a little higher than man. So even if angels created a little higher than us, upon following their own perceived authority, thereby denying God's authority, realized that it results in hopelessness, what lesson should we learn? Who are we to set up our own authority as being greater than that of God's? Why should we question the authority of God saying it doesn't line up with what we want to believe. You say, well, I don't know of anybody that's actually going around and saying that, but you do know people that are living it. And in doing so, they deny the existence, the authority of God. They are proving themselves to be unbelievers, resulting in nothing but hopelessness. But Jude's not done. Look with me in verse 7. He says, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now you talk with many religious people about the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. 
a lot will say that it was due to their lack of hospitality. They weren't a, a hospitable people, and, and that is why God pronounced judgment upon them and destroyed them. Let me tell you, such people that make that argument are attempting to justify homosexual practices, saying that that's not the reason Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, not because they were unrepentant homosexuals, but just because they were inhospitable. But Jude, in very clear language, affirms that the cause of their destruction was just that. They were glorifying the flesh. They were satisfying the flesh above all else. Whatever they felt like doing, they were going to do because it made them happy. And we all know as long as we're happy, that's all that matters, right? That's what society wants you to believe. That's what the world wants you to accept. But hope cannot be found in the glorification of the flesh. I want you to turn with me over to the book of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 24. And just as we read this passage, we're going to read down through verse 27. I want you to, as we read it, just see, does it sound very hopeful to you? Does this sound like a life that offers, that offers hope, that, that is something that is enjoyable and, and worth having? Beginning in verse 24. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound very hopeful. I want you to notice a couple words that, that is used in verse 24. He says, uncleanness, lusts, dishonor. No hope found there. In verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for the lie. They served the creature. That doesn't sound very hopeful. In verse 26, vile passions. They did which was that against nature. In verse 27, you have the word lust used again. Shameful. Receiving the penalty of their error. Any kind of a penalty does not bring hope. Rather, it is an indication of that which is hopeless. To glorify fleshly desires is to deny God because that's not how he created us. What was it, what was it Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19? What was the order of marriage? One man, one woman. And by the way, that means how you were born. Not what you th think you want to be because it's Tuesday. But how God created you is how you are. And God's order says one man, one woman. Anything else to support, to advocate any other kind of option, any other possibility, is to deny God. And denying God will never bring hope, but hopelessness. Jude, in verse 8, says that those who think hope can be found in denying God, they're called dreamers. In verse 8, he says, Likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. 
In addition to summing up the three examples that he has given in verses 5, 6, and 7, he says that, that these are dreamers. He cuts right to the heart of the issue. If you think hope can be found in any place other than God, such hope is nothing but imagined. A dream may seem real. But when the individual opens their eyes and recognizes reality, it's understood that it was all pretend. There was one night I was laying in bed, sound asleep. Next thing I know, my wife reaches over and punches me. Well, I thought, that's kind of rude to wake me up like that. Well, what I didn't realize because I had been dreaming was I was actually kicking her. But when I woke up, the dream no longer existed. It wasn't real. The reality was I was kicking my wife and she was hitting me back. I can't even remember what the dream was about. But see, such is hope in fleshly things. Such is hope when we try to think it's available by denying God and rejecting him and his pattern and his standard. It's all pretend. It's not real. It will not last. And Jude says, if that is what you think gives you hope, then you are a dreamer. And brethren, the disappointing and sorrowful fact is this. Most people do not realize that they're dreaming. Most people are walking around completely confident in what they perceive to be hope. Thinking that what they have is real. I know we have all heard of a placebo effect. You have different study groups. One are, are given the, the real medicine. Another one is given a sugar pill. I don't know if they still do that or, or not. I, that's just what I remember. It has no medicinal qualities whatsoever. And they compare the results after a while. And sometimes those that have been taking the placebo, the sugar pill, end up demonstrating signs of, of, of healing or, or something like that because they think... What they're taking is the real deal. Many people walk around thinking the hope they have is real. It's nothing but a sugar pill. It will not last. This is why Jesus said, if your hope, if your faith is not built on me, like a house that is built on a rock, on a solid foundation, then when the storms of life come, it will fall. They may walk around with their false sense of hope for a while, and, and it seemed like everything's okay. But as soon as the problems of life begin to come and the storms of life roll in, it will collapse and they won't understand why. And what do they often end up doing? Blaming God. God, why did you let this happen to me? God, why haven't you brought me through this? I was ready to ride the storm and you allowed me to sink. Why, God, have you done this? It's your fault. No, I'm sorry. It's the individual's fault because they didn't have the right kind of hope, the solid hope that a believer has in Christ Jesus. It was a false hope. You know, many people that are walking around in this dreamlike state of hope, when they are told they refuse to wake up. Because they're happy in their dreams. They have created for themselves this, this idea of what hope is. The problem is it's not founded, as we've been saying, on anything that is sustainable. It's not founded on anything that is going to last. It, it's put in, in man and man's ideas and, and feelings and emotions.
we need to make sure that our hope is going to be in that which is going to last and be sustainable. And so Jude uses Israel, rebellious angels, wicked Sodom and Gomorrah as examples. In verse 11, I want you to see, he just name, name drops some people here. He says, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Those three individuals, not good guys. You can turn back to the Old Testament. You can read their stories and the, the, the narratives where they, where they were participants and what was going on. And all three of them are not anybody you would name your kids after. And you put these together with Israel and, and angels and Sodom and Gomorrah. And there are many other examples in, the, in Scripture besides these six that serve as examples of hopelessness. That what they thought was hope was nothing but, but empty air. He gives these examples of what to guard against. And then in contrast, Jude demonstrates the only example in which true hope is found. And brethren, we need to embrace true hope. You know, in our estimation, there may be several examples in Scripture that would seem appropriate to consider. You know, we may, going back to the Old Testament, we may, you know, think of Noah and Abraham, Moses and David. These would be good examples to look at as, as true hope. But I want you to notice again what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews eleven thirteen. 13. He said, these all died. Who were the these? Well, when you go back to Hebrews 11, the, the, the hall of fame of faith, as we may refer to it as, these were the old covenant characters, those who died, lived and died under the Mosaic law. And so... The, the writer in Hebrews says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. In the Old Testament, their hope was in Christ prophesied. Because through him was going to come the receiving of the promises. They all died not having received it themselves, but knowing it was yet to come. And when we go over to the New Testament, we may think of characters there that would be worthy of consideration. John, Peter, Paul, maybe even Stephen, a display of what true hope looks like. But John would say in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, Truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Who did it sound like John wanted us to have hope in? Jesus. Paul would say in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach. Because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. You see, those examples that, that we hold up in Scripture as, as being you know, good, good role models and good uh, people to emulate, things like this, they put their hope in somebody else. In the Old Testament, their hope was in Christ prophesied. In the New Testament, their hope was in Christ realized. That who had been prophesied about was now here. John walked with him, engaged in the ministry with Jesus, saw him crucified, witnessed him being resurrected, and he said, he is the one you need to look to. Nobody else. 
but the Christ. Paul, much later, witnessed the same resurrected Christ, albeit in a different way from John, but the same person nonetheless. And he writes to Timothy that we trust in the living God. That is where our hope must be. And this is a very powerful lesson for us to understand. True hope can never be found in mortal man. True hope can never be found in mortal man. You see, many times we abuse that word hope. Maybe not abuse, misuse would be a, a more appropriate way. I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. Right? I know it's been good for the crops, but I'm ready to turn some goats into my backyard. It needs mowed. So I really hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. Do I have any idea about what the weather's going to do? No. I can look and see what the meteorologists are, are predicting um, and then usually go with the opposite. But see, that's not hope. That's a misuse of the word hope. See, the word hope, as we use it in Scripture, as the Bible uses it, it's an expectation of something that's to come based on that which has already been experienced. That is why those in the Old Testament put hope in what was to come because of what they experienced by the hand of God then. They knew because of what God had done for them prior that what he said was going to happen. And so they put their hope there. John witnessed, right? He witnessed Jesus. So he put his hope in what was to come. Paul witnessed Jesus. He put his hope in what was to come. We have the accounts of all those who witnessed Jesus. Therefore, we are to put our hope in what's to come. In him. Not in any mortal man. I want you to consider with me. Back in Jude... Verses 20 and 21. I think this is the real heart of this topic in Jude. Where, he, where we are looking at Jesus being the believer's hope. I think this is where Jude really brings out that principle. After having revealed to us examples of what hopelessness is. Now, let's look at what hope is. He says in verse 21, or verse 20, but you, beloved, who is the beloved? Who is it that he's writing to? Well, we're not told that it's a particular name, right? To, like to Philemon. We're not told that it's a particular congregation or area, you know, like to those in Colossae or Galatia. But I want you to look back at verse 1. Because it does identify who the beloved are. In Jude 1 it says, To those who are called, sanctified by, the, by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. It seems that being in Christ is what offers hope. To those that have been cleaned by God. To those that are made secure. And the location in Jesus Christ. That's who he's writing to. And so he says in verse 20, But you beloved, beloved in Jesus, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, which was built 
on Jesus, praying in the Holy Spirit, which is possible through Jesus, keep yourselves in the love of God because of Jesus, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. To that I say, thanks be to Jesus. See, our hope is in Christ because without him, none of this would be possible. How is it that we are able to have communication with the Father? It's through our intercessor, his son. We are connected through our mediator, his son. Our faith is built on who Jesus is, what he did. For all of us. And it's that hope. That is able to sustain us and carry us through. Waiting for him to return. To claim us as his. And to usher us home. In the book of Jude, Jesus is the believer's hope. And while you cannot find the word in the text, you can find the principle that without Christ, there is no hope. And anything else that we try to do is only going to create, ultimately, a sense of hopelessness. I would like to conclude by reading what, for me personally, is the most hopeful statement in the letter written by Jude in verses 24 and 25. Jude says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. I have hope regarding my eternity because of Jesus. Nothing aside from my own decision to relinquish that hope can ever change that. You can't take it from me. I can't take it from you. The devil can't take it from us. But we can choose to let it go. We can choose to place our hope in something that is empty, that is a dream. Put your hope in Jesus. Put your hope in the one that is going to sustain and carry you through this life. And then as we read the book of Jude, look at the examples he offers and make sure that your hope is not in that which goes against God, but that which will bring you closer to him. I thank you for your kind attention this afternoon. Thank you, Chris. You know, I don't know. Uh, we were talking earlier that this is a tough hour. You know, it's the last hour of the of the evening, and it's just a tough hour. But I think you did a great job. We appreciate it very much. Now, don't forget tonight at seven o'clock, Keith Ritchie will be here, and his topic is in Revelation. He is the victorious Lamb. I'd like to ask Brother Eddie Kraft, if he would, to come up here and close us in prayer in uh, just a moment uh, as he makes his way. Is there anything we need to announce, Bill, or anything before we dismiss? Well, if you will. Oh, over here. Students meet with us over here uh, to my right. Uh, let us stand, and Eddie's going to close us in prayer, and we hope to see you tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank thee for the lessons that we have enjoyed to listen to today, and we thank you for the presenters. 
We're thankful, Father, for your love for us, giving us thy word that we may study and grow in your grace and knowledge. Now depart with us this afternoon and to bring us back tonight as we continue our study of God's precious word and having your son the center of all that we do and think. Forgive us when we fail you. In Jesus we pray. Amen. <laughs> 